Happy Canada Day! My name is Lucas Weiss, and I am the host of the Wee Sports Quarantine Chronicles. On this special Canada Day episode of the Chronicles, I bring on Doug Smith, the Toronto Raptors writer for the Toronto Star, who's been covering the team since the franchise's inception in 1995. In this episode, I chat with Doug about his upcoming book, We the North, chronicling 25 years of the Toronto Raptors, Vince Carter playing in Toronto, the DeMar DeRozan era, the impact of the Raptors winning the championship, what it was like for Doug to cover this historical moment as a writer, the growth of Canadian basketball, and we finish off talking about the legacy of the 2019-2020 Toronto Raptors, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. The Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. So make sure to like, rate, watch, and subscribe to all three of those channels. Happy Canada Day. Now let's get to the episode with Doug Smith on the Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles. All right, on today's episode of the Wii Sports Quarantine Chronicles, I'm joined by Doug Smith. He is the Toronto Raptors writer at the Toronto Star. Doug, thanks so much for joining me today. Ah, my pleasure, Lucas. Good to be here. And Doug, exciting news for you. You got a book coming out in October titled We the North. You can, of course, pre-order right now. And I'm just curious, I mean, what that process was like. I know you've been covering the team since the Raptors started in 1995. So a lot of stories to tell, I'm sure. Yeah, a lot of stories, a lot of way, sort of a lot of difficulty in compressing 25 years into 70,000 words and developing different themes and not giving the bad years short shrift and not being laser focused on last season. But I think it's an interesting tale of a franchise from start to finish, start to the point we're at now, as opposed to laser focused, as I said, on the 2018, 2019 season. Yeah. And of course everyone, you know, still, you know, is remembering that, that epic championship run last year, but, Maybe just start back, you know, at the beginning, 1995. You know, you, you know, you're working for the Toronto Star. You get assigned this this new team called the Toronto Raptors. And it, what was that, you know, like for you? I mean, because it was just so new at the time for everyone here in Canada. Yeah, actually, for the first season, I was working for Canadian Press here in Toronto and did mm. both the Raptors and the Grizzlies and then moved to the Star for the second season. But it, it was new. You know, everybody – no one had any idea what it was. I was familiar with basketball. I played it at college and knew a bunch of guys from the national team program and had done the 92 Dream Team and 92 Olympics. So it was, a, it was a passion of mine. I enjoyed the game. And frankly, not a lot of people wanted to write about basketball. So when they asked for hands, mine went first up because I had a feeling it would be good. I knew it would be fun to watch. I loved the sport. And it was a really interesting story from that day forward. And, of course, the Raptors, you know, they start – in the Sky Dome, I mean, <laughs> this is, and of course, this is a couple years after the Toronto Blue Jays win, win back-to-back World Series championships. So, so it must have been a little strange just to, you know, just to see this uh, new co- concept basketball being played at Sky Dome. It was a, you know, it was a basketball team playing in a baseball park in a hockey city. <laughs> so there was all kinds of different layers of layers of things you had to get through to make sure you got the story told. And, and we did. We, we knew that there was, you know, Katie Press and at the start, we knew there was a hardcore collection of basketball fans. And if we told good stories well, that it would become a significant thing. And I, I think, you know, there, you, we couldn't concentrate that much on the wins and losses because they were, they were an expansion team. They weren't going to be good. It was sort of stacked, the deck was stacked against them from the start competitively. But it was an interesting sociological story and an interesting new sport it's the first new sport we've seen in toronto in decades and decades and it was uh, was kind of fun to be chronicling it of course there's a lot of talk right now about vince carter with with him retiring from the nba and, and where you know his place is you know months raptors history i'm just curious doug for you you know when you were covering vince just how did the the whole atmosphere and attitude change around the team and the following of the team when Vince came and, and played for the Raptors? Well, it became a global thing. Like he, he absolutely put the Raptors and Toronto basketball on the map globally. It was you know, 
it wasn't like traveling with the Beatles, but it wasn't too far off. You know, he was a uh, from that time in 2000, the dunk contest, the the Olympics in Sydney, the 2001 playoff win over the Knicks, and then the seven games with the Sixers. It became a he became a global phenomenon, and there was a time when in that 2000 2001 era that he was among the top five basketball players on earth, and it you know the inherent interest and excitement about him wasn't certainly limited to Toronto to Toronto or even to Canada. It was it was worldwide. He was a he was a phenomenon uh, all around the uh, all on planet Earth. What do you remember from that uh, that slam dunk contest? I mean, obviously, it's uh, you know it's over. It's, 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 it's become a meme and, and a gift from from now until forever. But you know, just to see someone from Toronto being able to do those abilities was just incredible. Well, you got to understand, I was also writing a dunk contest copy on deadline because it ended at eleven o'clock east which was the time we had to file. So that was, that was a little bit tricky. But it, it, was, it was a coming out party. We, had seen, we hadn't seen those dunks, obviously, specifically. But we knew, having followed Vince for all his time here before that, we knew what he was capable of. And the astonishing athleticism was not really new. The way the fans reacted to it, the way his fellow players reacted to it, that was what I'll remember is that the, the gasps, the, the players just in awe of what they'd seen in five dunks that probably had never been put together before in, in, in a row. It was, it was a phenomenal night. It was electric in that arena. Doug, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you mentioned it in the book, but I mean, I feel like, you know, for me, you know, I grew up during, you know, the, the Chris Bosch years and, you know, there were some, you know, rough seasons, you know, certainly, you know, oh, covering yeah. the team, but I think when it changed, you know, with the whole, we, the North, you know, campaign and, you know, Masai coming to Toronto. And then of course, Kyle Lowry, DeMar DeRozan, where it felt like a real shift just in terms of, you know, what the Raptors could do and just the popularity. Like it just felt like, you know, the people that were going to watch the Raptors in the playoffs in Jurassic Park, very different crowd than what Maple Leaf Square was for the limited times the Leafs made the playoffs. So did you get that sense when you were covering the team that, you know, there's a real shift here and now basketball is starting to become the it theme to follow here in this country. I, I, I'm that continued it. I've seen it a couple of years before that. You, you got to understand Lucas. I think Canada and the GTA and Toronto changed. Mm. It, it's, it's dynamic change. It's, it's, it's makeup of population change. And I think that basketball caught on that wave of a change in dynamic in the country and in our city and was able to capitalize on it. You look, like you said, you look at the crowd and it was all encompassing. It was men, women, white, brown, black, young, old. It was, it was far more reflective of Canada and Toronto than a hockey crowd had been 10 years earlier. And that's, that's undeniable. And Doug, for you, you know, you're, you know, you're writing, you know, for the Toronto Star and, and it feels, you know, of course, the media landscape has changed so much. How has your coverage of the team changed with just the changes that have occurred with uh, the sports media industry? Well, everything's so immediate. Everything's 24-7. You got to get, you know, back in the day, you would go to practice, you'd go back to your office, you'd write a story, it would go in the paper the next morning. Now you go to practice and you're tweeting out while it's going on and you write it as soon as it's after, as soon as it's over. And then you write again something else later on in the afternoon. The, 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 the star, the, the way people are starved for even the little bit of minutia news 24 seven has made the job much more difficult and much more challenging because frankly, there's a lot of stuff you could put on the Twitter every day that really doesn't matter, but people want to see it because they want to be titillated. They want to be fed something immediate. And, the ability to craft a story or develop a theme or, or work on something over a course of time is now gone. And it's changed the way we write. It's changed the way we report and it's changed the way people consume news, sadly, because there is no room for the bigger picture because everybody wants everything right now. Well, I see you. I mean, you know, especially, you know, let's say last year's playoffs where, you know, you're writing, you know, a piece on a game and, you know, you, you write that, you know, quick game recap that goes up on Twitter and then it's just, you know, just your quick thoughts. And then you obviously have to go down and get quotes and you throw that up and then, and then you write something else about the team and, and the series and the game and then you throw that up. So 
it's just this constant just churn of information. And of course, for you at the start, there's also still that deadline, right? You still got to, you know, meet those deadlines. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah, there's, still, there's still a time when the paper closes. But and, and it's just a, I think that's the skill of being a B reporter these days is finding out what's pertinent and what's important and what's, what's lasting. And yeah, you can give them quick hits if you want or a couple of quick sentences here and there, but it's the ability to get not more important stories, but bigger stories and develop them and, and still make them relevant when everything changes every 40 minutes, it seems. Back to the book. And, and you know, because I wanted to ask you, because I'm, I'm fascinated by what, you know, you, you know, your commentary on the DeMar DeRozan era, because of course, obviously the Raptors, you know, had, you know, finally had that thirst of, you know, playoff success when, when DeRozan and Lowry were here, but, they, you know, they'll always be the precursor to eventually, you know, the champions that were 2018, 2019. What would you, what would you say is like the legacy that DeMar DeRozan leaves behind here with the Raptors in that era? They won. Mm -hmm. He played here, they won. And that's the bottom line. And I understand that, that he wasn't here in the Kawhi Leonard, Danny Green year, but without DeMar DeRozan, that, that year never exists. It never, they never get close to it. He suffered through a lot of bad years. He had 22 wins seasons, like, like awful, awful, terrible, mentally grinding seasons, and stuck with it and showed teammates and fans that if you stuck to something, you could, make, you could be a success at it. I felt bad that he wasn't here to win the championship, but his fingerprints are all over it and will be forever. I wanted to ask about, you know, you as a beat writer, because, you know, again, you know, you obviously covered, you know, some winning seasons, but some losing seasons as well. Was that, you know, a unique challenge for you, those losing seasons to figure out uh, ways to create content and get people interested in on your, your articles? It was terrible. It was like they had nothing to say and we had nothing to ask. <laughs> there was a year that they lost, I think the third year, the 16 and 66 year, they lost their first two games, won their third and then lost 17 in a row. And by about 12 games into that 17-game losing streak, the season was in the toilet. And we all knew it. Everybody knew it. Players knew it. Coaches knew it. Reporters knew it. Fans knew it. But you still had 60 games to go, 65 games left to cover. And that's when you turn to writing stories about people as much about games and about uh, issues as opposed to who won last night because they were never going to win. And that, that continued in that – that post Vince era, you know, Vince after Vince left, I think they went through 24, 26 win seasons. It was dreadful, <laughs> but that's the job. You gotta, you gotta find a way to keep plugging and keep readers entertained and informed. And then on the flip side, Doug, you know, you have a year like last year where there's so much attention now on the team with their championship run. And of course, a lot of talented writers writing about the Raptors. How do you stand out in that sense then, just given all the attention now because the Raptors are winning and it's a good thing? Well, that's, that's really funny because uh, when you're in the finals or conference finals or deep in the playoffs, everybody's reading you. All your colleagues are, all your friends who in the regular season may not read you every day. They might check in every now and then, but everybody is reading you those days. And you're really under a lot of pressure to be good. And you're a lot under pressure to be under a lot of pressure to get something rather somewhat unique and something that plays off your expertise having been around these guys for all that time and that was it's a lot of fun it's a lot of challenge it's a lot it's awful hard work but it's sure worth it in the long run it, and when you get outside it like well uh, while a championship is being won i learned you don't appreciate it what it is mm. until you're able to sit back six or eight weeks and go holy crap we did this we worked 75 straight days under intense pressure and intense scrutiny and turned out some pretty damn good stuff. And that's when you can say, well, okay, maybe I am all right at my job. <laughs> well, it's funny because I've had Blake Murphy on the show and your colleague at the star, Dave Fezchuk, and, and, and they said the same thing, how, you know, when, when you're in the moment, and look, there were a lot of great moments, the Kawhi shot, the Kawhi dunk over Giannis, being in the NBA finals, but you're, you're, you're on the job, and, you, and it takes a lot longer down the road for you to really appreciate what you just witnessed because you got to file that deadline try to figure out what you're doing in such a tight time frame. Yeah, you, you get caught up in the, in the moment. You get caught up in the, work, in the workflow, the, the, the stress, the pressure, the, the responsibility. But when you can sit back in July and sort of watch the games of the finals or watch game four in Philadelphia and go, wow, there was – 
that was really something to see. When you're seeing it, you understand it. But when you sit back from it, you appreciate it. So after sitting back, you know, as you did, was there a moment that stood out to you in, in last year's final that you'll never forget? In the final, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Uh, my most memorable moment of the final was hearing O Canada before game one. But that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's sort of mushy me. The, 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 the thing that stands out through the entire playoff run was Kawhi hitting the three-pointer over, over Joel Embiid in the, at the, with a minute to go in game four in Philadelphia. Mm. He misses that shot and they lose that game. Their season is over. <laughs> and then everything gets blown up. It gets, it gets blown up. Mark Gasol probably leaves. They probably trade Serge Ibaka. Kyle doesn't get his one-year contract extension. Everything changes if that shot doesn't go in. And that, to me, was the moment that they took the Sixers' soul <laughs> that shot and I think they understood at that time that yeah we're pretty special and he's pretty special well yeah and like that series you know Kawhi certainly you know exerted himself as you know one of the best players in the NBA but even in that game too Doug like Pascal Siakam was injured and like they weren't sure. you know they lose game three Joel Embiid does the airplane and it's but you know it's not over yeah. till it's over and like I think they really show what type of caliber team they could be yeah, Philly is a tough place to play, and, you know, Pascal was hurt. They weren't playing particularly well. Fred Van Vliet wasn't playing very well. And Danny Green hadn't made a shot in a long time, and they still found a way to, to take, the, take the game when it was on the line. I think that was the one that, at that point, I thought, uh-oh, this is going to be really special. You know, and then game three against Milwaukee here, the double overtime game, when Kyle files out with five minutes to go in the fourth quarter, Pascal misses the free throws to extend the game even longer, like that. Those kind of moments are, are the ones that in 25 years you're going to go, wow, that was pretty cool. And, and, you know, Doug, back, you know, to the book, you know, because I know that you wanted to, you know, give onus to, you know, you know, years ago with the Raptors compared to, of course, you know, recently now. And I'm just curious in terms of structure, you know, do you sort of mix in, you know, a bit of history with player stories or is it mainly player st personnel stories? How do you sort of, without giving all the way the secrets, you know, the structure of, you know, your, your, the book. It, it's, I, I guess, Lucas, the best way to put it is 25 different themes. And those themes can either be people or issues. And it runs from, you know, the first chapter is game one in 1995. The last chapter is obviously game six in Oakland. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people stuff in there. There's, I'm not sure there's a lot of new, there's not a lot of investigative stuff. I think it's more memory and more, this is how they got to the point in 2019 from the point in 1995 and uh, you know, the, the Isaiah Thomas, the Damon Stoudemire, the, the Brendan Malone and the first coaches, the, the evolution of the women in the program, the, the fact they used to train in a really inadequate college gym and now have this millions of dollars worth of facility at OVO that, you know, that, that kind of evolution theme is I hope what runs through the, the book. Yeah, and like, and of course, you know, the end, and you know, certainly it was last year in the finals. You know, you see all those Jurassic Parks popping up throughout the country. Of course, you know, like you, I mean, I remember Game One, the the national, the Canadian national anthem, and just saying like, "Wow, like a Canadian team is in the NBA Finals," and like you never would have imagined that, but here we are. So it it just goes to show you that over those twenty five years, how how basketball has grown and, and it's reflected in, you know, the people of the country as well compared to other sports. Sure. You, you, look, you look at, you're talking about back to the Vince Carter issue. There are kids who were six years old when he arrived who became basketball players because of him hmm. and, and are to this day in their early twenties playing basketball. And I, and I, that's solely because they could see him play in their city and for their team. And I think there was an era before that, a wave before that, that was there because of Damon Stoudemire and the simple existence of the Raptors. And I think that's the impact the sports had on kids then who are now young adults and whose kids now might be brought up by basketball fans instead of guys who were brought up by hockey fans who in, in, in earlier generations of Canadians. And how do you think, Doug, this momentum and enthusiasm continues? I mean, obviously, you know, if the Raptors win in the next few years, it'll continue, but continue. But 
more at the grassroots level and, and, you know, more focusing on the Canadian talent that we have. I mean, obviously there's a lot of NBA talent and, you know, in college. So I'm just curious your thoughts on just how do we continue this momentum in basketball becoming one of the most popular sports in the country? Well, I think you've seen it at a lot of different levels. Look, it's just this Canadian elite, Canadian elite basketball league that's now seven teams spread out across the country. is very hugely, to me, very important. It's a, it's not so much a Canadian league, but it's a league for Canadians. Uh, players, coaches, executives, general managers, front office people, support staff. And I think that's the continued growth of the game. Obviously, it's, it's very it's new. It's just in its second season and on a pause because of the pandemic. But I think that's the kind of thing you'll see. I think if the men's national team could ever have any kind of success, that might spur some other stuff. I know firsthand, and I've been very, very close to the women's program, since 2010 and 2012, there is a generation of young women basketball players who are playing because the Canadian team went to the London Olympics in 2012. And I know that for a fact. And then that's the kind of, I don't think you need to be hugely successful, but you need to be out there and need to be seen and be able to be touched by the people who want to play the game. And that, that's where the Raptors go. They keep, they keep being successful. More kids are going to want to go watch them play. More, more kids are going to want to play in their neighborhood. And then you just just grow from there. Well, and the Raptors have certainly kept, you know, it going this year after their championship, but obviously it's such a strange season. And, and of course, I want to shift gears to sort of talk about the NBA right now and, and where we are. But, you know, and for you as a reporter, you know, covering the team, you know, a certain way for so long, and now this pandemic happens and, you, you know, you're used to virtual calls and not being in, in the arena. Has it been a unique weird challenge for you, Doug, as a oh, beat writer for the team? It's impossible. It's just it's hugely difficult. And, and it's understandable. It's just not, it's not normal. Normally you would go and you would see these guys face to face. And if you needed to get one player off to the side, you could walk away with him and have a conversation. You can't do that now. You can't, you can't get him to go sit in front of his computer while you sit in front of yours. And you can't ask a question solely on your own because there's hundreds of other people listening on the Zoom call. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hard to figure out it's hard to win stories, but it's, it's also hard to know exactly how you're going to approach it day by day and week by week. Like I, you're at the whim of technology and you're at the whim of timing. And it, that, that's, a, that's it's going to take a lot of learning and a lot of getting used to. And I don't know what it's going to be like when I start playing games. I honestly don't. It's, it will be, they will make it somehow workable, but it certainly won't be easy. And I don't think it's going to be very much fun for guys like us. Well, yeah, and they, my, my concern, Doug, is, you know, what if they just sort of, you know, obviously we're in a pandemic, but what if they just keep this sort of restricted locker room access? I know that before the pandemic happened, there was a lot of, you know, talk about the NHL shutting down, you know, media uh, locker room access in, in the NBA. But, unfortunately, you know, with access already, you know, limited, you know, to begin with, it must, you know, hopefully this doesn't, you know, become a permanent change yeah. that these leagues do. I, I can't see that happening. I think the leagues, and, and I can't speak for the NHL or Major League Baseball, obviously, but I know the NBA understands the need for interaction between humans. Mm -hmm. And that's what may, may not be exactly the same. The locker rooms may be closed a bit longer and for different periods, but the ability to have a conversation with a player is going to exist, mm -hmm. whether it's after practice or after shoot around or before a game or after a game that's going to happen. And I think the leagues understand that we need it. The readers need it. The viewers need it. And it's not going to go totally away. There'll be changes. There'll be changes in social distancing. There'll be changes in the, the amount of time we have. And the world's going to change. But I don't think you're going to get to the point where we're doing everything virtually because that doesn't serve anybody well. Yeah. And like, of course, you know, you need that you need that locker room access, like, like you say, you know, to talk to players because let's face it, like, you know, in the NBA playoffs, when they go up to the podium for the press conference, they may not be as open as when they are talking, you know, one-on-one -on -one with you off to the side, right. Which could lead to a really compelling story. Of course, obviously it's all about building relationship and you can't do it if you're doing it virtually with hundreds or tens of dozens of other people there. That's why when they seasons on, you're there every day. You might not get anything, but they see you, they know you. And when you say, hey, Fred, you got a minute? They'll say yes. And uh, I think we'll get back to that. 
it'll be a little bit different, but you know, I think by certainly by the start, by the middle of next year, 2021, that is, uh, we'll be, we'll be almost back, back to much more normal than we are today. God, I hope so. Yeah, likewise, fingers crossed, Doug, it, it, you know, with this Raptors team, you know, there's, there's obviously more to be written given, you know, what they do in, in Florida, but what do you think of is the legacy of this 2019, 20 team? Because they started the season with people thinking, well, they're not going to be as good, but they've surprised a lot of people. I think they're resilient. I think they're professional. I think they're very smart. And I think when, whenever the season ends, however it ends, the, the legacy is going to be, this was a good bunch of guys that figured out as they went along and were very compelling to watch and to see react to different situations in games. I don't know how it's going to end. I don't think anybody has any clue who might have an advantage when this thing starts. Old teams, young teams. It's so strange and so foreign and so against the grain that no one has any idea. But I think when they write the story of the 2019-2020 Raptors, it's going to be a good bunch of guys freed it out, went through a lot of bad stuff, and still won a lot of games. Final question for you, Doug. And, and, you know, and I usually ask this of all my you know, sports media guests. And you know, obviously, you know, the industry has changed so much and you know, given different you know, platforms now to disseminate news. But I'm just curious if you have any advice for young you know, journalists looking to you know, pursue this as a career. Because while it, is, you know, while it has changed you know, since you started, it still, you know, can be a real fulfilling career if you get to a level of, you know, covering a team and being able to write about sports. Oh, it's a great job. I love my job. There's mm-hmm. no question about it. I'm lucky to have it, and I'm glad. I'm very appreciative and fortunate. My only advice to young journalists, and I tell this to them all, find a place to write. Don't pigeonhole yourself into one sport or one city or one province. Expand your horizons if you have to. Something you something may find you as opposed to you finding something. But here's the thing. Always find a place where your copy or your words or your video is edited. Make sure someone sees it who can make it better because you may think it's good, but it's not. Mm-hmm. You gotta, you can't just hang your shingle out and say, Hey, I'm a writer. Mm-hmm. Someone's got to help you through that process. An editor, a colleague, someone has to see your stuff, but fine. Just find it. Just and be, don't say I'm only going to start at the Toronto star or the, Ottawa Sun or the Hamilton Spectator. Be willing to go into Alberta, Newfoundland, Vancouver, wherever you got to go to find work, go find it and do your best at it and just, just work. Just find a way to work. But get paid for it. Mm-hmm. Do not be a free intern because that's cheating. Mm-hmm. That they're, they're cheating asking you to do it, and it's not a wise thing to do. Doug Smith, he's the Toronto Raptors writer for the Toronto Star, author of his new book, We the North, coming out in October. Doug, thank you so much for joining me today on the We Sports Quarantine Chronicles. My pleasure, Lucas. Anytime. Good luck.